We return now to our insight into the new nuclear arms race. I spoke exclusively to retired Rear Admiral John Gower, who was the United Kingdom's Assistant Chief of Defense Staff until December 2014. He told me of his fears that the buildup of a new generation of nuclear weapons could make a nuclear conflict more likely. Admiral John Gower, thank you for, for spending time with us. You retired as the Assistant Chief of Defense for the United Kingdom, but before we get to the, that very large role, I want to ask you that you also commanded two Navy submarines. I was a submariner from about five years into my career in 1983 when I volunteered, and I worked my way up to command by 1992. I commanded a diesel-electric submarine for two and a half years, and then I commanded a nuclear-powered but not nuclear-armed hunter-killer. If you're a commander on a submarine, who gives, uh, in the British Navy, who gives the order if you have nuclear weapons? It's the Royal Navy, um, and the, the order is given by the Prime Minister. Uh, the only uh, release authority, if you like, for the employment of the UK's nuclear weapons is the sitting Prime Minister. And it goes directly to the boat? It goes as directly as you can. You don't expect the Prime Minister to sit on a teletype and send the message, but the Prime Minister sends, uh, fills out a, uh, uh, a message form and then under control of two individual people at all times, thereafter the message is coded, uh, passed to our transmitting station and then through a variety and a multiplicity of paths is transmitted to the submarine where it is decoded, it is validated as a, uh, as a correctly formatted and clearly from the Prime Minister giving the codes that it was encoded with and then the boat will follow the instructions. Can you imagine as a commander of a submarine receiving an order like that? I can. I, I was never in command of a ballistic missile submarine but I was responsible in my last two appointments before I retired for the operational policy uh, amongst other things. In other words responsible for preparing the force for that instruction and the commanding officers, it is the single most important thing that a ballistic missile submarine commanding officer has to deal with, uh, and they need to be ready to do so. Uh, but the strength of the nation's deterrent rests on the fact that whatever the Prime Minister instructs them to do, uh, they will do it. There are four Trident submarines, um, and they are being renewed now. You're going to have four new submarines. Uh, there is always one at sea, and what is the, what is this, the, the strategy? For uh, nearly uh, 48 years, uh, we have had a ballistic missile submarine continuous at sea, and the, the primary reason for that is that because as a nation we have a reasonably small deterrent, if you compare it with that of the Soviet Union and the US, and then latterly Russia and the US, um, we rest our deterrent on its credibility due to its invulnerability and that invulnerability occurs at sea. And so because of that, because it is an assured response, uh, we can maintain a very low level of deterrent in terms of numbers of missiles and warheads, and we don't um, exacerbate any crisis by sailing as a nuclear-armed submarine, which you would see in crisis, and that in itself would escalate. So because there is a boat always at sea, it is not going to be found. It cannot be interdicted beforehand. You cannot preempt the deterrence. The missions stay at sea, stay silent, stay secret, and wait for what? Well, they, they do all of that, and they wait, and they hope they don't receive, but they are always waiting for that message. Tell me, the, the US now um, has a triad of, of bombers and submarines and land-based nuclear weapons. Why did the United Kingdom decide no triad just to stay with submarine platforms? In the mid-1990s, we removed all of our helicopter and air-carried versions of the last bomb that we had and concentrated solely on the Trident system. So part of that is a scale decision for us. We are not, uh, we're not the United States, so clearly we have a different worldview from the United States. Um, partially, what's, different, what's different about it? Well, we, are not, uh, we do not consider ourselves, I would suggest, a superpower in the same way that the U.S. does. Uh, we made the decision in the 60s to uh, deliver our deterrence through NATO. In fact, it was one of the conditions that the U.S. placed on the U.K. as part of the Polaris sale. And so we view our contribution not as a nation alone, although it is a national deterrent and deters alone as well as 
through NATO. Um, and therefore, that's a different choice of scale. Do you see the upgrading uh, or updating, and it's probably important to, to, to clarify that, of the U.S. nuclear arsenal of, to the tune of a trillion dollars over 30 years, do you see that as going against uh, eventual disarmament in the world? Does I, that concern you? I, I don't. I, I don't because, as I said, I don't believe, and I think this is shared by uh, everyone who analyzes the value of deterrence to the strategic stability of the world, and that part of that is nuclear deterrence, the world is not yet ready for that. Um, and it is important, if that deterrence is to be credible, that it is maintained by up-to-date, secure, credible, and effective, and safe weapons and systems. And every weapon and system has an age, doesn't last forever. Would you comment on nuclear cruise missiles? Because the, the UK does not have them and made a conscious decision, I understand, not to arm with them. The US is now debating it and it is being hotly debated about as part of that triad and that updating uh, process. Do you go with cruise missiles that have nuclear warheads on them? And some people don't like the idea. No, and, and I, I don't see cruise missiles with nuclear warheads as adding to that strategic stability that I said was the important uh, line that you want to maintain in all of your activities. Is it dangerous? I, I think dangerous is an emotive word and uh, they themselves are not dangerous but the biggest argument against them um, which is the primary argument that carried the day uh, in the UK studies is that if you have conventionally armed cruise missiles and you have nuclear armed cruise missiles and the platforms are the same when you launch any cruise missile the adversary or anyone else cannot be certain that that is nuclear or conventional. So this um, chance of misinterpretation... Right, in so the chance of misinterpretation, when going back to that, is th th your f adversary may not understand it's a conventional warhead, they may think they're under nuclear attack. They may make that choice, they may make that decision, and of course if they are themselves nuclear capable, that might lead them to launch their own nuclear weapons uh, in advance of the arrival of the cruise missiles in a kind of lose it or use it chance. There is a very nervous world taking shape and some people are, are said to be on a hair trigger including Russia. I think Russia, I mean hair trigger again is another emotive word. We've, we have been accused of sitting on a hair trigger on our uh, ballistic missile submarines. Nothing could be further than the truth. They're uh, at several days notice to fire at the moment. Um, when they're deployed, so that, that is not a hair trigger. Russia's uh, rhetorical use and practical flying of its capabilities, its nuclear-capable bombers and its submarines and its, uh, uh, and its rocket forces from the ground, as an extension of, of Vladimir Putin's rhetoric about um, NATO expansion, his reasons for going into Ukraine and the Crimea, um, and therefore it is very much part of their day-to-day -day business. I think what you risk doing is you risk lowering the threshold of the first use of nuclear weapons. And it's very important to remember that that is a, a, a sort of internationally self-opposed taboo that has been in existence since Nagasaki on the 11th of August 1945. That's a long time that a particular weapon has not been used in anger. And that a lot of people feel that the Russian uh, doctrine is quite clear right now is that they would contemplate first use of a nuclear weapon if they were being overwhelmed uh, by conventional forces. I think there are, many, there are many reasons why they might contemplate first uh, use, including if they were on the offensive into, say, the Baltic states. They see it as a way of controlling s conventional escalation. This is in their open source doctrine of controlling conventional escalation early on. And the challenge of having a weapon that is equivalent to theirs is that you can't keep nuclear, you run the risk of not being able to keep nuclear weapons at the strategic level of the relationships within our countries. If, heaven forfend, a NATO state and Russia got into a conventional conflict, that may happen. But you don't want the first resort of either side to be nuclear weapons, or even the second, or even the third resort. You want to be able to deal with a conventional conflict without resorting to nuclear weapons. So how do you view the Russian movement of Iskander missiles into Kaliningrad uh, to counter the missile, anti-missile defense system? That, does that not take us to a dangerous precipice? It is certainly not helpful. Um, 
and to try and draw a link between ballistic missile defence, which is aimed at low, effectively low and slow ballistic missiles out of uh, other states or indeed um, any state that, that uh, controls these low and slow ballistic missiles, to conflate that with a strategic nuclear risk um, is emotive and wrong, and Russia has been doing that for a number of years. Uh, certainly to move Iskander missiles, which they are alleged to have done into Kaliningrad, is extremely unhelpful. However, I would contend that, that NATO and the UK in particular deters the use of those missiles like any other missile in the Russian inventory, like any other nuclear weapon, by saying that if you, uh, if you employ a nuclear weapon against NATO, which we are uh, a member under Article 5, we would respond. We would certainly react uh, to a, a request from NATO to the Prime Minister to employ UK nuclear weapons, and our response would be through the Trident D5 missiles in our submarines. And my personal view is that by following down toe-to-toe -to -toe in capability with an adversary, you risk lowering the threshold at which those weapons are used because there's almost a pre-acceptance that a small use by one will be responded to by a small use by another. My view is that that does not aid a deterrence. Now, there are others with, with an alternative view who view that you need to be able to match. I just don't agree with that. So what is the alternative then? Well, the alternative Mutually view, assured destruction? No, I, the alternative view is that you achieve deterrence because your deterrence is credible because if he launches a very small uh, nuclear weapon, they argue it is incredible that you would launch ballistic missiles in response. Um, my view is that once that weapon has exploded, you're in a completely different world. And in order to deter that, you must make sure that your um, deterrent is strategic, it, implacable and invulnerable. Can you just take me back to MAD, to mutually assured destruction? Because that was the deterrent. If you fire one or you fire ten uh, at the, the continental United States, it doesn't matter. You risk... A, a volley of hundreds of nuclear weapons coming your way to stop you from launching any more. Now it would seem that the Russians are breaking the mold and saying you could have a limited nuclear exchange. All through that period where MAD was one of the out, potential outcomes of a nuclear exchange, NATO and the Soviet Union had concepts of flexible response. In other words, you would have the ability for a small nuclear exchange to cap it off, if you like, and it would stop. The problem with that is that while you could game play, uh, theoretically, that you could control the escalation, uh, no one is convinced that you really could. No one who has analysed it believes in escalation control. And that is what I think concerns um, particularly the Eastern European countries when they look at Russian nuclear sabre rattling today. How, as people are updating arsenals and expanding their arsenals, depending on the country, how do we unwind this now? We are far away, which is why I agree with President Obama when he said this is a long-term project. But you have to look at the lens all the way down and then work back from it. You have to look at these gates. And each of those gates you must be able to step through while maintaining strategic stability. So you cannot take the situation where one nuclear weapon state believes, rightly or wrongly, that it suddenly has a massive advantage. It happens at that time to have a leadership who is opportunist and not in the general interest, and you may inadvertently ignite a conflict with nuclear weapons at that point. So it does require a very long-term project approach to this to come up with a, with, a, with a skeleton plan that could take you to zero and then slowly bring other states into it. Admiral John Gower, thank you so much. Thank you. That's all for now. I'm Dana Lewis, and that was Insight.